Yeah, what up, y'all? This your boy, Flame, a.k.a. St. Lou. And remember, God does not need our good works, but our neighbor does, you feel me? before you go, go, go. that extra note. <laughs> Welcome back to Extra Notes Academy. This is season number two, episode number seven. Facts. <laughs> We're moving along. We're still talking about this EP, Extra Notes, and we're going to get into the second half of the interlude title, Good Works. But before we do that, somebody asked me a great question. The guy name, the, the person's name is Engine Man 2 What's up, Brody? He says, Engine Man says, Flame, were you moved to be baptized again after you learned of it as a gift of regeneration? It's actually a great question. Um, So to answer it, I would say I was not. Here's why. So Paul says in Ephesians that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? So the one baptism that I experienced is sufficient, even though it was done under a different theological tradition. However, that tradition still baptizes in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit in the triune name. So God was present doing the work in the baptism, although I didn't rightly understand what was taking place in the moment. I thought it was an outward sign of an inward change because that's the way it was highlighted and talked about, unfortunately. But now that I understand properly what God was doing in that moment, I simply can rest in the work that he performs, that the grace that he delivers in baptism. So there will be no need to go back or to be baptized again because God's work is sufficient. The Bible says that he is faithful even when we are not. So I'm covered. Peter says that baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. So I now have the assurance of my salvation rooted in multiple places. And one of those places is in my baptism. So I no longer, uh, I so I don't have to, you know, be baptized again. Now, if someone was baptized in a Mormon church where they teach three different gods or Jehovah's Witness church where they teach that Jesus is a God, um, then I would say that person needs to be baptized for the first time because what they experienced in those other traditions was altogether different than the Christian message, the biblical message. So in those cases, we would say a person needs to be baptized for the first time although they may have experienced something similar in their Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or any other Christian sect that is outside of the parameters of orthodox or solid, good biblical Christianity. Anyone that was baptized in those you know, spaces need to be baptized for the first time. But in my case, praise God, I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's the Try your name that God says, I'm going to stamp you with my name. You are being baptized in my name. I'm putting my name on you saying this is my son or this is my daughter. And that is what's taking place. So there's no need to be baptized again. But yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, and, And for you as well, you know, if you're learning more about the way the church has always understood baptism and you're being convicted by the scriptures and the Holy Spirit is illuminating the way you understand your baptism, there's no need for you to be rebaptized because your baptism is secure in God's work. It's not about us doing it to feel better or to um, to hit reset and say, oh, now I really understand it. Now let me do something about it. That's just, you know, oftentimes our default is for us to do something. And it's, it's hard to, you know, really settle in for God is the one who's doing the work. He's delivering the gifts. There's no follow up. Right. We passively receive the gift that he gives us and we got the gift. Amen. We've been baptized and uh, there it is. So no need for you or anyone else to be rebaptized if it's been done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's a long answer, but that's the true biblical answer. You feel me? <laughs> and you know, it's so dope. Even as we think about baptism, someone else sent me a message. I can't track it down. So my apologies to the person, but they were saying Man, Flame, I'm really following along and I'm seeing the connection that Paul makes between circumcision and baptism and how that impacts infants. And he's like, you know what? I'm, I'm being convinced by the scriptures that we should baptize our infants because in the old covenant, circumcision was an external rite 
a means that God used to bring infants into the kingdom. Now, obviously, only the males were circumcised, but baptism is this fuller expression where God expands things. So it's not only the infant boy, but it's the infant girl. And uh, he brings those children not into an external community only, but he saves and delivers them. He grants children the gift of faith. You see this in Psalm 22, Psalm 71. Uh, John leaps in his mother's womb as he is filled with the Holy Spirit. So he has this faith even in his mother's womb. It's just replete throughout the scriptures that infants can believe. They hear the voice of their dad, their father, God, who brings them the same gift that he brings us. And he does it through baptism. And uh, so that's a beautiful thing. So I'm excited to hear that people are tracking, they're following along with how the majority of Christians that have existed and that exist today see baptism rightly according to the scriptures. And that's encouraging because we need all of God's promises as we are living in this world and not only one or two that are certainly sufficient, but in terms of God's bounty of blessing. Why would we only take one gift from God when he says, I want to lavish you with my grace, with my assurance, with my comfort. Why would we say, nah, I'm cool. I just want a little pinch of it. Nah, give me the whole cake. You feel me? Give me the whole pie because God wants me to have it. So I think that's a good way to process these realities is give me all of God's promises. Give me everything he says that is mine. So as I move throughout this life, I have so much comfort here. There I'm bumping into comfort everywhere I turn. I'm running into grace at every point because God wants to give us life and life more abundantly. You feel me? That's, that's just Bible, my guy. Yeah, so let's get into this uh, interlude. And uh, this part two is concluding good works. And let's hear what was said, and I'll stop and chit-chat. So let's go. We ought to look extra nose or outside of ourselves towards the righteousness of faith, which is our justification for assurance. This is where we find identity, stability, objectivity, and security. Luther is committed to justification truly being sola fide, meaning by faith alone. His primary emphasis is on serving your neighbor through your vocation. This I love that. Our identity, who we are as people, should be rooted in what God is doing for us. So as we're moving throughout this world, trying to stay rooted in who we are as all of these ideas are bombarding and flooding our minds as to who am I? What should I like? What should I not like? What should I think in my mind? What should I do with my imagination, my creativity, my sexuality, my, my strength, my age, my time, right? What should I do? And the Bible lets us know that you are a creature, right? God created you. He's your creator and he gave life to you freely. And we are dependent on him for that life, not only physically, but even spiritually. And that spiritual life is a gift, just like your physical life. Like none of us protested to be born into this world. God on his own decided to create on his own decided to gift us. And he sustains us in life. And he does that spiritually in terms of our salvation. So that's what our identity is in, what Jesus is doing for us. That tells us who we are. We go to God's word. So I like that um, when we think about justification by faith alone, it's tied to our personhood, our identity as people. And that's a beautiful reality. So we should cling to that, you know. Activity and security. Luther is committed to justification truly being sola fide, meaning by faith alone. His primary emphasis is on serving your neighbor through your vocation. This emphasis helps to maintain the clear distinction between our identity being found in our righteousness of faith, which we receive from God, aka passive righteousness, versus our performance or our act of righteousness, which is righteousness we live out for the benefit of our neighbor. As Christians, we sh I love that. Because we should be active in the world. So do not hear me saying because we're saved by grace that we just chill. Because we are given this gift of salvation, we have nothing to do in life other than just fall back and soak up the sun. That's not what we're saying. God's good intention with giving us his grace, his salvation, 
is that we would be an extension of his love in the world, that we would be an extension of his hands, his feet, and we can move into people's lives as, as a through line, a pipeline from God through us to people as we serve them and we can build into their lives in all of the varying areas that we find ourselves. So we are an extension of God. And I love how, again, I've mentioned this before, that in Matthew 25, Jesus says that when you are serving people, you are serving him. He said, man, Lord, you, Jesus says, when you feed the poor, you're feeding me. When you clothe the naked, you're clothing me. When you visit the prisoners, you're visiting me. So the point is, when we serve people, we are serving God. And, and I love the cycle of that is we're serving God as we serve people. And God is using us to care for us. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Both kinds of righteousness, but for different purposes. We should guard against our good works becoming the basis for our righteousness before God. And we should guard against our righteousness of faith being used to eliminate the need for good works. Our good works have value here on earth. Coram Mundo, but it does not justify us before God, Coram Deo. It is vital that we keep these separate. Beautiful. It is vital that we keep these separate. So hold dearly, hold tightly to that reality because the old Adam will put pressure on us to blur those lines because it is complicated and complex for us to think to embrace that we can do nothing to earn our salvation. And uh, so as God, by his spirit, applies his words to our hearts, uh, may we know that we are secure, that we are safe, and that God got us. Now we can move into the world and we can be active. And, uh, yeah, so whatever your skills are, whatever your talents are, God gave you those. So don't feel insecure about them. Sometimes people feel like, man, I wish I was this or I wish I was that. And you start to be jealous or covet other people's talents and gifts because sometimes in this world, we place more value on other things that, you know, are praised or things that go viral. We, we place more value on those things and we become insecure. And um, but God says, no, I gave you the gifts that I wanted you to have. I gave you the talents that I saw fit to give you. Use those to the best of your ability. You know, you don't have to be a genius and all of these different areas, whatever your learning capacity is, whatever your mental intellectual capacity is or is not. Amen. God gave you what he wanted you to have. Use it. Enjoy it. You know, expand it, multiply it in the world. And you will benefit from that in terms of the excitement of being on mission with God and serving people. And people will be grateful for your service. And uh, it's just, a, you know, it's a beautiful thing that God has done for us in that regard. So, yeah, so that's pretty much it, man. Good works. I named it that because it's important to think that we still do have good works to do in the world, but we have to keep them rightly oriented and not mix them in the bag with our justification that's from God to us that we can only receive from him that gets us justification or being made right in his sight. Amen. Amen. That's it. <laughs> Y'all already know. What time it is. It's time to get back in this book right Cheer, the genius of Luther's theology. So we're going to pick up where we left off, page 41. And this is titled, The Word Bestows the Benefits, Righteousness of Christ. All right, real quick. So if you want to learn more about ancient Christianity as preserved through Lutheran thought on important topics like baptism, the Lord's Supper, justification by faith alone, the law and the gospel, and so many other beautiful confessions, make sure you check out cph.org. There you'll find so many Christ-centered resources that'll help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and the hope of the gospel. You will find books, Bible studies, devotionals, and some of my favorites like The Spirituality of the Cross by Gene Veith, has American Christianity failed by Brian Wolfmuller to name a few. You feel me? Make sure you go to cph.org or you can go to cph.org slash flame and you will see a list of books that I've curated that I've read personally that have helped me out in my walk. So make sure you go there, tap in, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. You feel me? Let's get into it. As they inquired into how we receive the righteousness of Christ, the reformers made a critical distinction and 
between Christ obtaining salvation for us 2,000 years ago and Christ delivering salvation to us centuries later. Here, Luther's strong theology of the word steps into the foreground. Although the work took place on the cross and the forgiveness of sins has been acquired, yet it cannot come to me in any other way than through the word. For Luther, then, a Christian who desires to receive the forgiveness of sins cannot run to the cross. For there, forgiveness is not yet imparted to us, nor can we count on receiving it by keeping the memory of the suffering of Christ alive in our minds. Instead, we must go to the word that imparts, gives, proffers, and delivers the forgiveness of sins that has been purchased on the cross. Christ bestows his righteousness on God's human creatures through the spirit who brings it to us in the gospel. It's beautiful. Luther saw in his opponents, both the medieval theologians, as well as the more radical elements of the Reformation, such as the Anabaptist, a tendency to deal with God apart from the word. That's dangerous. In the former instance, the church claimed a revelation of God to its hierarchy. In the latter instance, they saw it as an inner voice within each Christian. And that's dangerous because if, if we say that God speaks to us with this inner voice and it has authority above scripture, how do we test that? Anyone and everyone can say God gave me a specific word, a special word. And are we to just believe every person that says God says something to them? God gives us a sure way to know how he is communicating, what he has communicated, and it's in his word, it's in his Bible, rightly understood. In the former instance, the church claimed a revelation of God to its hierarchy. In the latter instance, they saw it as an inner voice within each Christian. These examples attested for Luther that the chronic refusal to deal with God through his through the word clings to Adam and his children from the beginning to the end of the world, fed and spread among them as poison by the old dragon. What we must not underestimate in a thought of Luther and Melanchthon is how the concept of promise, quote unquote, is central to their understanding of the gospel and their definition of faith. So this concept of promise is important. Let's lock that in. While, quote, good news, end quote, provides an etymological translation of gospel, it runs the risk of being viewed primarily as information about yesterday's events. I love that. Removing the temptation to just see this as mental assent to ideas, to trusting in God's promise. Beautiful, his good news. Like a newspaper, it deals with past events. In this case, the past event of Jesus's earthly life. But when that happens, faith can be seen as little more than a form of intellectual activity, what the reformers criticized as historical faith. Such faith by itself cannot save since the devils believe that Jesus died and rose. That's what it says in the book of James. Even the devils believe and they shudder. It's not good enough. By itself, the biography of Jesus is not yet the gospel. So just these facts about him. <laughs> That's not the good news. Not yet. It becomes the gospel when it grasps the sinner with the promise that Christ lived, died, and rose for you, quote unquote, and, quote, for me, end quote, and, quote, for us, end quote. <laughs> The term promise highlights several things. First, the Bible is filled with promise. The promises of God highlight the unity of the Old and the New Testaments better than the term good news. Second, the promise brings out the personal and relational character of God. God himself makes promises to us. 
third in the gospel, God promises that he will receive us into the new age as fellow Christians and co-heirs with Christ. The promise is a pledge and guarantee of God's favor in the eschaton, meaning the end times. Finally, and most important for Luther, the promise is not an announcement that will be fulfilled only in the future. It is a creative word that takes immediate and present effect in the here and now. It brings about the very thing that it announces about the future. It creates the reality that we are justified. It announces that we have gone through the eschatological judgment ahead of time. Judgment has already been taken care of for us even before the last day. The word that freely justifies us is the same word that first gave us physical life. Luther liked to say that God has his own grammar when he speaks. His words are not like our words, which we speak into thin air. Instead, God's words makes things happen. Let there be and it was, man. Commenting on Psalms 2, Luther stated, and when he speaks, the mountains tremble, kingdoms are scattered. Then, indeed, the whole earth is moved. God's word says what it does and does what it says. Indeed, by his word, God calls into existence the things that do not exist, Romans 4, 17. When he said, let there be, he brought all things into existence, Genesis 1, 3. 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24, 26. When God says, sun, shine, the sun is there and at once it shines. Accordingly, the words of God are not full of hot air, but are things very great and wonderful, which we see with our eyes and feel with our hands. This means that human life, life as such, is a life that depends on God and God's word. God's word did not bring about all things only at the initial moment of creation, but embraced the entire subsequent creation. For when God once said, Genesis 1, be fruitful, that word continues to be effective down to this day and preserves nature in a miraculous way. Luther believed that God already created us who lived centuries later when his word created the entire world, Genesis 1 through 2. Wow, interesting. Speaking about himself, Luther commented, In God's sight, I was begotten and multiplied immediately when the world began because this word. And God said, Let us make man created me too. Whatever God wanted to create, he created when he spoke. Not everything has to come into view at once. Similarly, an arrow or a ball which is shot from a cannon, for it has greater speed, is sent to its target in a single moment, as if it were. And nevertheless, it is shot through a definite space. So God, through his word, extends his activity from the beginning of the world to its end. For this reason, Luther can describe God's word as being without end and remaining effective to this day. For Luther, God's creative word runs through the past, present, and future and binds them together. In God's eyes, all things are present to him at the same time. For Luther, just as the word of the Lord had defined reality in the act of creation, so In the act of recreation, the word of the Lord also defined the fundamental reality of the believer's existence. Wow, that's powerful. So when God saves, he saves. When he declares us righteous, it runs from that moment and never ends. Wow, what assurance that brings. My goodness. Let's keep going. Thus, there is no conflict between being declared righteous and being made righteous. For years, Lutherans have debated a well-known statement by Melanchthon. To be justified means that out of unrighteous people, righteous people are made or regenerated. It also means that they are pronounced or regarded as righteous. For scripture speaks in both ways. 
this is no debate between forensic righteousness and essential righteousness. To put it this way, as Gerhard Forty remarked, is to pose false alternatives. He argues that the absolute forensic character of justification renders it effective. Justification that actually kills and makes alive. It is to be sure, not only forensic, but that is the case only because the more forensic it is, the more effective it is. Thus, justification is not a legal fiction. The word does what it says. When God declares a person to be righteous, that person is actually righteous. The word has brought about a new reality. A new relationship has been established. Luther did not define the status of the believer as if one were righteous. The believer was not fundamentally a sinner for whom God has purchased a ticket for heaven. Where the sinner will finally lose that sinful identity while in this life the sinful identity remains primary. For Luther, the word of the Lord had defined reality in the act of creation. And in the act of recreation, the word of the Lord also defines the fundamental reality of the believer's existence. In this word, God created a relationship in which the new identity and status is determined by the word. With their understanding of the gospel as promised, the reformers provided a new understanding of the sacraments. In this word, God created a relationship in which the new identity and status is determined by God. With their understanding of the gospel as promised, the reformers provided a new understanding of the sacraments. By the mid-1520s, Luther moved beyond an Augustinian Platonic framework for the sacraments that viewed them as signs of a reality that lies elsewhere. He moved toward a view of God's word in its sacramental form that brings the benefits of Christ into the world. In baptism, we here and now undergo the death and resurrection that we will go through when Christ returns. Thus, baptism does not simply initiate us into a life of progress, dying and rising through repentance by which we slowly become emancipated from sin, Paul teaches that baptism is not a sign, but the garment of Christ. Woo. In fact, that Christ himself is our garment. Holy absolution is God's eschatological word, his final word spoken in the present. The Lord's Supper imparts the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, for pardon, and the last judgment. Thus, it promises that we will participate in the eschatological banquet in the age to come. Woo, I love how he's breaking down the sacraments. The sacraments aren't these things that initiate salvation and then after you benefit from them, you have to work to keep yourself saved and keep going through all of these rituals to maintain your own salvation. Although the sacraments give you a boost and, and give you, you know, grace but then you later have to exercise all of these rites and rituals to maintain that faith. Luther's saying, no, that's not what the scripture says. He's talking about the reality of these promises that initiate salvation, that sustains you in salvation, and that secures you. So even on that final day of judgment, you are already taken care of based upon God's gifts that he's delivered through the person of Jesus and how the person of Jesus comes to us in these supernatural ways and the means of grace, the sacraments, baptism, the Lord's Supper, the absolution from the pastor. Oh, my goodness. This is rich. Wow. Selah. Whoever partakes of it already now sits at the table of the Lord and one day will be his guest in the future reign of God. Receiving with the mouth the body and blood of Christ brings to remembrance the death of Christ and arouses the anticipation of the coming of Christ. In the meantime, the reception of the body and blood of Christ is food for wayfarers. 
enabling them to wait for centuries or even millennia for Christ to return. The declaration that we have been vindicated or justified does not come directly or immediately out of heaven to us. Instead, God delivers his promise to us through another human person in a very creaturely fashion. God is okay with using creation. He's okay with using means. His creation is good. It is not beneath him to use earthly elements. That is a false notion that has been circulating and dominating American and Western Christianity for too long. God says, this creation is good. I can use it how I want for your good, for your benefit. Facts. God engages his people again through the relational dimension of life. God established the ministry of the word. The reformers drew on the rationale of Paul in Romans 10, that in order for people to believe They must hear the word, but for them to hear the word, it must be proclaimed to them. And in order that it might be proclaimed, God sends people to proclaim it. (laughs) Thus, another person speaking in the name and on the commission of God speaks this promise to me. Yet it is the speaking and acting of God. The reformers like to quote the words of Christ to his followers. He who hears you, hears me. Luke 10, 16. The moment we turn away from God's promise, we are left with ourselves and our judgment about ourselves. This is good. This happens when you remove the reality of what the sacraments are. It leaves us to ourselves and it leaves us to be judges of ourselves. So now we're trying to use our own feelings, our own intellect, our own memory of our past Um, achievements, spiritual achievements, so we can feel good about it and find some comfort. Like, yeah, I'm really saved because two weeks ago, I didn't do that bad thing. Or for two, two years, I've been, I've been doing good. Although I messed up a couple of times last week and we are, we're looking for all of these things to cling on to as we are judging ourselves, trying to do our best job. But that's sad and unfortunate. And it leaves you as a frail, feeble person without the hope and the promise that God delivers us through his word, in these supernatural realities that we know as the sacraments, using physical, regular, earthly things like water, bread, wine, a preacher, a person, a fellow sinner. Wow. This is to fall back into uncertainty. The Lord who came near to his chosen people in the person of Jesus Christ comes near to them through the words he has others of his chosen people to speak in this way he bestows passive righteousness for he wants them to have the peace and joy that comes from being certain that he loves them and will remain their father god cares about our certainty so he gives us his word in all of these different ways so that we can know so that we can be completely assured and not have to doubt, not have to live in that doubt and to function as our own judges trying to recall how good we are if our good deeds outweigh our bad and if we're good enough and trying to remember and to reflect and to ponder or or to intellectually know enough doctrine or theology. These are all ruts that we fall into when we have an unhealthy deviation in our understanding as to God's word, his promises, and how he's delivering those through physical means. The sacraments, <laughs> his visible word. Next section, righteous by the joyous exchange. A promise without faith accomplishes nothing, but faith without a promise has nothing to which it can cling For Luther and Melanchthon, the promise of new life in Christ and faith in that same promise were corollaries. A promise by its very nature seeks a response. For example, when a young man makes a proposal of marriage to a young woman, his proposal seeks a positive response that joins their two futures together. A promise seeks to elicit the response of faith. Faith grasps 
the promise. And in this way, the promise finds its realization and fulfillment. At the same time, Luther stressed that trusting the promise is not an accomplishment that we can claim for ourselves. Beautiful. Let me read that again. Luther stressed that trusting the promise is not an accomplishment that we can claim for ourselves. On the contrary, faith is the work and gift of God who justifies a person by giving faith to that one. To that end, the promise of the gospel itself creates and sustains that which it seeks, faith. In an analogous way, we observe that in human relationships, speaking psychologically, those who are trustworthy elicit our trust. They do not command or compel it. People have confidence in savings bonds since they are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. It is much more the case with the promise of God. It is as unshakable as God is. And so it is trust creating. The reformers themselves drew on the example of Abraham who realized that God keeps a promise on account of his faithfulness and not on account of works or merits. In our case, the promise is addressed to human rebels who resist God's overtures at every turn. Through the promise, the Holy Spirit courts people. He seeks to melt away their resistance and win over their hearts. In a similar way, young people speak about falling in love. This expression contains an element that suggests we were not in control of the moment, that it just happened to us. We do not plan for it to happen. So also when the Holy Spirit ignites the spark of faith within us that grasps the promise. As faith responds positively to the promise, It embraces this promise and clings to the one who made the promise. Here, Luther likened faith to a wedding ring by which the Christian becomes joined to Christ in marriage. Luther declares Christ and the soul become one flesh. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. Bold, strong statement. Wow. Christ and the soul become one flesh. Commenting on Galatians 2.20, he writes, faith must be taught correctly, namely that by it you are cemented to Christ and he and you are as one person, which cannot be separated, but remains attached to him forever and declares, I am as Christ. And in turn, Christ says, I am as that sinner who is attached to me and I am. To him. Wow. For by faith we are joined together into one flesh and one bone. Christ is not only the object of faith, but is himself present in faith. Ooh, beautiful. The believing heart holds fast to Christ just as the setting of a ring grips the jewel. We have Christ in faith. Faith does not leave Christ outside as if he were merely someone to think about or believe in but embraces him, saying, he is my beloved and I am his. By creating faith and joining us to Christ, the word of God affects what Luther would call a wonderful or joyous exchange. In developing the marriage metaphor, Luther drew on German law to develop the idea of an exchange that takes place between Christ and the believer. This is important, this joyous exchange, this wonderful exchange where Christ gives us his righteousness, he takes on our sin. And everything that is Jesus's is now ours. German law distinguished between that which belonged to a person was that person's own and that which one possessed or used as in possessions is nine-tenths of the law. He pointed out that in marriage, everything that properly belonged to to the groom now comes into the possession of the bride and everything that properly belonged to the bride now becomes the possession of the groom. This union affects an exchange. So also with Christ and the Christian. 
it follows that everything each has is thereafter held in common, the good as well as the evil. Ooh. The believing soul can boast of and glory in whatever Christ has as though it were its own and whatever the soul has, Christ claims as his own. Ooh. My goodness, Lord, thank you. Thank you for taking on our sin, our struggles, our weaknesses, and thank you for giving us your righteousness, your holiness, your purity, your sanctification, your being pleasing in the sight of the Father. Woo! That's what happened at Jesus' baptism. The Father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And we have that because of our baptism in Christ. Now we are clothed in Christ through baptism. Let's go. My goodness, this is, man, this is good. All right, all right, let me keep going. <laughs> everything that belonged to Christ now belongs to me. And everything that belonged to me now belongs to Christ. So in the promise, Christ declared, your sin is mine and my innocence is yours. By receiving the promise, faith hides nothing and holds nothing back from Christ. It replies to Christ, my sin lies on you and your innocence and blessedness now belong to me. The Christian is thus joined to Christ by faith that clings to the word and now accepts that Christ is totally responsible for us. This means our sins are now not ours, but Christ's. And Christ's righteousness is not Christ's, but ours. Only in faith are Christ and a human being so joined together, so made one that in God's judgment, the human person participates in Christ's righteousness. Woo, my goodness. For Luther, the good news of this happy exchange was that a person was not required, indeed, in as much as one was enslaved to sin, to purify oneself in order to become a worthy bride for Christ. Instead, Christ binds himself to a sinful creature. Luther drew on the example of Hosea, whom God told to marry a prostitute to illustrate that in word and faith, one who is holy joined himself to one who is unholy. As a sinner, Luther rejoiced that the rich and divine bridegroom, Christ, marries this poor, wicked harlot, redeems her from all her evil, and adorns her with all his goodness. This means that her sins cannot now destroy her since they are laid on Christ and swallowed up by him. Praise God, because we all need that, because we big sinners. Facts. <laughs> As a result, she has the righteousness of Christ, her husband, which she may boast is her own and which she can confidently display alongside her sins in the face of death and hell. In the joyous exchange, the believer gains clarity and certainty that God is no fiction and that the promise made to all who believe is not a lie. In other words, the gospel does not require a person to become internally like God or ontologically like God, meaning like you can't be God himself like as a being <laughs> in order to be united with him. In the case of an internal association of the believer, in God, a person is not required first to become like Christ by being transformed psychologically so as to become a person who has a perfect and undivided love for God in order to be worthy of his love. Indeed, Roman Catholic theologians of the day saw Luther's teaching of a joyous exchange of Christ's righteousness for human righteousness, which takes place through faith as blasphemous. In 1526, Jason Hochstrachten, the Dominican inquisitor of Cologne, summarized the traditional Catholic teaching on the subject as he ridiculed Luther's concept of the joyous exchange in which the Holy Christ unites himself to the sinful creature and thus eradicates our sin by making it his own and replacing it in us with his own righteousness. What else does those who boast of such a base spectacle do than make the soul a prostitute and an adulteress who knowingly and wittingly convenes to deceive her husband Christ and daily committing fornication upon fornication 
and adultery upon adultery makes the most chaste of men a pimp as if Christ does not take the trouble to choose a pure and honorable lover, as if Christ requires from her only belief and trust and has no interest in her righteousness and other virtues, as if a certain mingling of righteousness with iniquity and of Christ with Belial were possible. These people being critical of Luther, like, <laughs> Hostriton lamented that Luther listed no preconditions for the spiritual marriage of the soul with Christ, except that a person believes that Christ will bestow on him or her all that Christ promises. He complained that Luther did not speak about the mutual love by which the soul loves Christ. Luther said nothing about keeping the commandments to the keeper of which eternal life is both promised and owed. After all, in Hostriton's view, the key to union with God was to become more and more like God by acquiring the virtues Christ himself had exhibited. In the case of the ontological association of God and the believer, the person disappears into God by being absorbed into God's divine being. So as virtually to lose one's individual identity as a human creature. Luther's cementing together of Christ and the sinner does not blur the distinction between the creator and the creature. But in the early 1550s, the Lutheran reformer of the city of Nuremberg, Andreas Osiander, taught an ontological transformation of a person by contending that the believer is united with the divine nature of Christ. That's wrong. <laughs> Osiander maintained that the essential righteousness of Christ's divine nature, his righteousness as the second person of the Trinity, becomes the believer's righteousness before God. By being united to Christ, sinners are transformed by his eternal divine righteousness, which swallows up our righteousness as a drop of milk in the ocean, thereby transforming us into pure brides in this way christ joins a pure bride the obedience of christ and the death of christ were in the end of little consequence in osiander's exposition of justification some recent explanations of luther's doctrine of justification sometimes veer in osiander's direction by interpreting a few of his statements in a way that brings him into accord with an Eastern Orthodox view of salvation by divinization, also called theosis or theopiosis. These views ignore the radically different metaphysical base of Luther's understanding and that of the Eastern Church, and they ignore Luther's understanding of the dynamic, recreative nature of God's word. Luther opposed both the views of salvation by psychological transformation and the view of salvation by ontological transformation, both of which make sense only in a platonic spiritualizing frame of reference. He held that the verdict of justification does not come at the beginning or end of a movement toward becoming increasingly righteousness. Instead, it establishes an entirely new situation. The joyous exchange is thus not a substantial exchange, but a relational exchange. It puts me in a different set of relationships, which are the critical things, whether it means substantial change or not. Luther held that the Christian is a person who, to use his famous dictum, is simul justus epicotter, simultaneously righteous and sinful. The Christian is righteous by God's recreative pronouncement and the response of faith in Christ, whose righteous obedience is reckoned to the believer and sinful by virtue of one's fallen human psychological disposition and imperfect performance as a fallen human being. In his usual way, Luther expressed it succinctly and elegantly. Though I am a sinner in myself, I am not a sinner in Christ or to put it another way in myself outside of Christ. I am a sinner in Christ outside of myself. I am not a sinner. <laughs>
<laughs> we got to end it right there. But let me read it one more time. Though I am a sinner in myself, I am not a sinner in Christ. Or to put it another way, in myself outside of Christ, I am a sinner. In Christ outside of myself, I am not a sinner. Beautiful. Well said, Luther. Well said. My goodness. Man. Praise God because, yeah, we all realize that we are simultaneously sinners and saints at the same time. That that Latin phrase, simul justus epicotter, simultaneously righteous and sinful. And I love how that's phrased because it is true of our human experience as Christians. And we are living out in our lives both of those experiences. You know, we we are righteous in Christ. We have been made righteous truly with Jesus's righteousness being accredited to us. While at the same time, there's this sinful law that we that we experience in our day to day and our thoughts psychologically, emotionally, and in our inability to live up to par, to perform in a way that God says, that meets my perfect standard. We constantly fall short of that. So those two realities existing is Romans 7. That's what Paul talked about. When I want to do good, this evil is lurking around. And uh, he said, who can deliver me from this body of death? And then he, 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 he praised God that it's through him through Christ that we receive deliverance based upon what he's done for us and how he gets that to us through his word and his visible word, the sacraments. Amen. Amen. So next time, y'all, we're going to move into the latter part of this chapter and we're going to wrap it up. And it'll be, by and large, the end of Extra Notes to EP. There is an outro to the project, but we may or may not get into that. But my goodness, this has been encouraging so far. I hope it's encouraging to you because it is definitely for me, and I just, you know, I'm worshiping right now, even as I think about the Lord's kindness to give us the gift of faith. So all of us who are here listening, um, let's just thank God for his goodness towards us, and let's pray for others, those who have fallen away from Christianity, those who have yet to submit or to surrender. Uh, Let's just pray for them and ask God to soften their hearts and to deliver to them um, the gift that he's delivered to us. So, yeah, that's my prayer. That's how we're going to wrap it up. But y'all already know, this your boy Flame, a.k.a. St. Lou. And remember, God does not need our good works, but our neighbor does, you. Before you go, go, go. Extra note. <laughs>